The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Welcome to the Influencer's Edge. This is the place where you come to get the latest breakthroughs, cutting-edge insights, tools, and techniques to leapfrog over the pack in sales, persuasion, and influence. Be sure you visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, tune in, and enjoy today's episode. All right, I'm excited today. Our guest is Andrew Waltz. We have a very, we had a very interesting pre-talk before we went on the air, and I gave her a sort of encouragement slash warning that I'm going to ask a different set of questions. Where are you joining us from today? Right outside Orlando, Florida. Oh, my favorite place, Orlando. That's a <laughs> that's ironic. So let's give a little bit of your impressive biography. I'm just going to read it here because I can't memorize. Andrew Waltz is the co-founder of Courage Crafters. That's very interesting in and of itself. And co-author of the best-selling book, Go For No. Wow, that's counterintuitive. Yes is the destination. No is how you get there. Hmm. We can have a long conversation just about that. For almost two decades, she's been teaching people in virtually every business and industry how to think and feel differently about failure, rejection, and the word no to achieve their goals and dreams. She's a member of one of the highest regarded professional groups of women in sales. Very impressive. I mean that from the heart. Women sales pros, Andrea is considered a top sales influencer online, featured on lists curated by HubSpot, salesforce.com. That's impressive. Live Hive and many others. Her book, Go For No, reached number one. Whoa. Number one, not two or three, but number one on the Amazon sales and selling list in 2010 and has remained in the top 50 of sales books for the last 12 years. I'm going to hire you to coach me on how the hell you did that. <laughs> okay, welcome. My first question is never what my guests submit. You've obviously had a journey into learning how to do what it is you teach. So very briefly, what was your journey? How did you learn to have your NQ? And what does NQ mean? Right. NQ stands for no quotient. So you've got, you've got IQ, intelligence quotient. We've got EQ, uh, emotional quotient, uh, you know, emotional intelligence. And then there's NQ, which I believe is the most important. But um, yeah, I, my journey, uh, actually, I have been doing the same thing over and over again now for, for the last two decades, pretty much waking up every day and figuring out how to help people change the way they think and feel about rejection. But before that, um, I went to college, I got a bachelor of science degree in criminal justice. I wanted to be a crime scene investigator before it, there was a show about it. I was completely in love with catching bad guys. I wanted, I, I've got a thing for justice. So um, I just really wanted to put bad people into jail. And I wanted to be able to do that by solving crimes, uh, not by being a cop on the street. I wanted to, I wanted to, I guess, do the easy part, but there was no, there were no jobs in that. So in the meantime, while I was going to school full-time, I was also working full-time and I was at a company called Lens Crafters, the eyeglass retailer, yeah. and they promoted me very quickly into management um, it's where I met my now husband who kind of, he is my, he is my husband. He's also my mentor. And he educated Love me it. on what, what go for no means. I completely fell in love with the concept. And in the meantime, he also convinced me, he said, you know, they pay people to come in and, and speak at the corporate, you know, the annual corporate sales meeting. And those people get well paid. Probably they make what our monthly salary is in one hour. He said, I think we should quit our jobs and launch our own speaking and training company. And I was just young enough and naive enough. I said, 
Well, that sounds like a plan, even though I had no idea what I was doing. And so that's what we did about 20 years like ago. So let me pause you just a second. I think yeah. that's an amazing thing that you leaped before you saw the bridge. You just said, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. And you didn't think about it. That's ironic that you teach about how to handle fear and no and fear of rejection. But you yourself didn't have any of that. You just, am I getting that right? You just got excited with your partner and said, let's go do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess, I mean, in, in many ways, I... I think being naive is so helpful. <laughs> Sometimes, not not having th- not knowing all of the dangers and all of the mistakes. And so, in my mind, I was kind of like, "Well, if this fails, and it probably will statistically, I'm just going to go back and get another job, and it'll be different than what I'm doing now, and I'll be fine." I guess I, I guess I have a um, a confidence that I will survive things. So, how does that now? How does that personal attitude of yours when you started the business of, okay, if I fail, uh, I have something to go back to. I, I, you didn't even, how does that apply to what it is you teach in terms of, uh, I'm going to sneeze. Give me a second. (coughs) (coughs) I think I'm catching something, but you can't get it through, through this. So how does that apply to what it is you teach or does it? Uh, Yeah, I think it applies a lot because a big part of what we teach, the foundation of what we teach is rooted in the embracing of failure and the willingness to fail, the willingness to fail, and at least the willingness to, um, to face that failure and move through those failures if and when they happen. And you've got to be willing to do that in order to, you know, achieve success. So how do you separate out the idea? And again, these are not the questions you submitted, but I like this. This is great. How do you teach people or do you teach people to separate out the idea that, okay, my actions, my plan failed, and I am as a person a failure overall generally? Because my experience has been as a teacher and a healer that people come to me and they don't say, well, you know, I'm not skilled at this and I've had failures along the way. That doesn't m- much happen. That has to be trained. For the most part, people think I am a failure. Are, am I making a distinction that ties into what you teach? Absolutely. I agree with you. Most people, that is the challenge of separating out who you are as a person and the things outside of yourself, the things that you do. And for me, I, it comes down to almost reparenting yourself, going back to how you were as a kid and remembering the things that you were willing to fail over remembering how little failure meant to you when you were a child that you were going to try something. I always use the riding a bike analogy because it's so simple and everybody gets it and how you would do that. And I specifically remember doing it. I didn't care if I fell off in front of people and made a fool of myself. I had a goal. I was going to attain it and there was going to be a certain amount of pain and failure and embarrassment, but, but it was just part of that process. So a big part of it, Paul, I found is is that people need to give themselves permission to fail and mess up and sometimes almost just do things that without a lot of thought, without uh, the process and and be imperfect so that you experience it. And then you realize I didn't die. And actually I learned something because that perfectionism, I think is what holds people back. It's that perfectionism plus the the, uh, desire to not fail. So what I think I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is your process involves a lot of healing, that you have to do healing. So you are not just a sales trainer and teacher, you're actually a healer. Uh, is, have you ever thought about what you did in that, in that sense, that you're assisting people in healing? I never have ever categorized it or even thought to think of it that way until this moment. And putting that on feels... I almost unworthy and it feels so good. Like I love the idea of that Um, because to me, I, 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 I house it under the term of, of changing mindset. So I don't, I don't haven't thought of it that way, but I love it (laughs) because I find it. So I find it so warm and cozy and, and I, you know, I, I like that part of it. Well, see, I told you this would be a different kind of show. (laughs) I like to dive deep with people. So let's talk about, um, 
if someone is struggling with fear of failure and rejection, what it, let's dive a little bit more into how you help them with that. We've gotten some general outlines, a little fuzzy. Let's dive down a little bit more into the process. So the actual process, the strategy of go for no, and I like to say it's kind of part strategy, part philosophy. Um, and, and really it's built on the principle of failure that you can't, if, if you want to be more successful, you have to be willing to fail more often that they are not opposites. They are opposite sides of the same coin. And so the whole idea of go for no, the whole idea behind it is that you need to, from a sales standpoint, but really it could apply to anything in life, intentionally increase your failure rate or, or intentionally go out and be willing to hear no more often. And when you do that, you will by law of numbers, uh, you will in fact hear more yeses when you intentionally increase the number of no's that you hear. And there are a lot of nuances to this. Obviously you have to do it intelligently. If you go to the gas station and you just start asking random strangers for things, it's probably the wrong way to go about it. I mean, you want to be talking to your ideal prospect and you want to be asking good questions. So there are ways of doing this properly, but that's the fundamental strategy. Let me ask you this. So this begs another question, which is, I understand your strategy teaching people to deliberately go out there and hear no and fail. But do you also teach them how to learn from those failures so they can extract maximum learning from it? Because I've found so many times people say, just learn from every experience, but they don't give a process and they don't have any teaching around that. What is your, do you teach people how to learn from those failures and what is that process? And are these different questions than you're used to getting? <laughs> they are different and I love it because I love being challenged. Uh, so the honest answer to your question is not as well as we could. So you've literally given me an idea and a, and a path to go down. The funny thing about this subject, Paul, is that what I have found over 20 years of teaching this, this, I will tell you, this started off, the book is a fable, and we can talk about kind of what, what's in the book, but it started off so much of a, hey, this is a numbers game type of strategy. If you talk to more people, if you hear no more often, you will start hearing more yeses. And, and it was very simple. Um, it's not necessarily easy for people to execute in the real world <laughs> because they have to confront those demons. And that's where the mindset piece comes out. But what I've noticed over all of the years of teaching this is it's like a tree. There are these little branches that start sprouting off from the main trunk, which is this philosophy. And the one that you just brought up is one of them is, yeah, you do need to learn from your failures. You do need to, to if you are getting nothing but no's, You've got to stand back and go, wait a minute, where's the, what am I missing? Where's the gap? And I think I could do a better job actually of teaching people to analyze that, which is, uh, are you talking to the right people? If you are, if you could, are convinced that you are, and you can, you can empirically show that, then the next question is, then are you not asking good questions? Are you not explaining what you have to offer in such a way that they get it? Where's the communication breakdown? Or is it at the end of the process where you do everything and then you go, so what do you think? And they go like, nah, so you're not building the value. That is a process that is important. And the people that are successful, I think, do yes. that and they do it naturally. Yes. Well, I think you're giving people a double dose of courage. So let me give you another uh, thumbs up. You're teaching them the courage to hear no, but you're also teaching them the courage to look at their own behavior and to courageously look and see, here's what I did with clarity. So it's a double dose of courage that you're teaching people to give. So uh, genuine applause for you. I love it. You, you're you're uh, quite the catch as a coach and a trainer. I'm so thrilled I have you on the show. So let me ask you, let me unpack this. What's the difference between no and, well, I'm not clear or I'm not sure or not yet. Can you help us with that distinction? Yeah. I mean, oftentimes um, when people say no, they, uh, they don't have all of the information. So my, one of the things that I like to teach people is to really see that no that they get as a gift. And if you're getting, and, and when you think about getting a gift and you're handed it, the main question you think is, well, where am I going to put it? What am I going to do with it? 
And so hopefully this triggers in your mind a, a feeling that there's a next step and a next step in the process, which is what's my next move? How can I keep the door open to figure out, is this no the end? Or is this, uh, they don't have the information. It is a timing issue. They are just uh, dealing with, we know that every customer and as consumers ourselves, fear of change, fear of making a wrong decision, all of those things. And so when we see that no as a gift, it's how can you stay engaged with this person and not run? Because I think the tendency is for a lot of people to get the no, and then they feel immediately that they've done something wrong. It's shameful. It's embarrassing. I've messed up. And so they just want to hightail it out of there, metaphorically speaking, or physically sometimes. And it's, wait, 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 let's use this as a bridge. So see this as a gift. How do we keep this thing going? Stay engaged. I love that. Have the courage. You didn't say have the courage, but I'm going to put words in your mouth. Have the courage and the presence to stay engaged. And that is so rare. I think uh, you set yourself apart so powerfully when someone is saying no to you and, and rather than run and rather than push or pressure, you just stay engaged. You're teaching people to really stand out as salespeople because you're not running. But at the same time, you're not pushing. You're just staying engaged and present, which is, am I getting this right? Or am, I, or am I reading into it? Absolutely. And it's it's fascinating to see what people go through. One of the things that I have started doing this year, I've never done it before. I'm not really, I don't think of myself as a, as a coach so much. I have built my business as a speaker, go on stage, talk for an hour and leave. And I finally decided that I was hiding a little bit. And that I needed to challenge, I was ready to challenge myself to do more small group, more coaching things. So this year I've been doing these 21 day go for no challenges. And I've watched, what's so great is I'm watching people changing and having these epiphanies in real time, which of course, as a speaker, you don't get because you go, you talk, and then you say, good luck applying this in your life and in your business. Um, And of course you get the round of applause, which all speakers like as well. This I, the idea of coaching people and really watching them have to implement it and face their fears and make these decisions of, okay, I've, I've got to do this now. I've paid for this. And this woman is expecting me to come back next week with some results has been so fascinating to see because that's where you really see what's going on with people. I can't come up with the epiphanies for them, but they do. But you're doing your forensics as you watch them. Uh, you're doing your forensics and your yes. sort of failure investigation, failure crime, failure scene investigation. You're looking at them going, mm, here's forensically where they need to shift and change. So I think that's still there in the background of your mind. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so insightful. And I'm not surprised that you came up with that. So yet again, another idea. So failure scene investigations. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> and I also think, let me give you another uh, I don't mean to seem like I'm buttering you up, but I, as a, as a healer and a trainer and someone who ships minds myself, um, I I think my observation about you is that you're service minded and impact driven. So I could see how it's more fulfilling for you to watch your people get results from how you, what you're doing than opposed to speaking because you can't see them. You may see the lights turning on, but you can't see the result of that. So that's great that you have the insight and the courage to once again, make a shift when you didn't know exactly how it would turn out. So I think you're an example of the very thing that you teach, which is a a wonderful thing. You're showing up doing what it is you teach. And I think that reflects in the ability uh, of, of what you're doing. So fantastico. Um, let's, <laughs> I'm loving this interview. You're, you're super sharp. So um, how persistent should you be? When is no? How do you know when no is like, okay, done. Uh, they lost my number. Uh, I, I uh, Go away. Yes. It is definitely an art over a science. Uh, I remember you talking about this topic as well on a podcast recently about how, you know, per- people can be persistent to a fault. And if you're persistent at the wrong thing, um, then yeah, you can waste a lot of time, effort, and energy. So we want to be going for no intelligently. I do think that most people give up what I have seen way too soon. They 
get a no or they don't get a response and then they just assume they assume no means never instead of no meaning not yet they aren't willing to stick through those uh those dips and so being patient i think is a big part of it um and learning to communicate in such a way that you're not desperate that people feel and and that really makes you very attractive. So it's, I think, educating people, staying in contact with people, that positive persistence, not the beggy desperate persistence. Right. That's something that you learn with experience um, over time, but it does require that you you not uh, just assume. And I, I think making assumptions is probably the number one quickest way to just crater a a good go for no strategy is you come up with all the assumptions in your head and then you do nothing because you, you know, you prejudged and you've decided what people are going to do. So it's being open-minded and saying, Hey, I'm going to stay persistent with this person until I get some really good data that they're not a a good client for me. They're not a good prospect, or they really just don't want to work with me, which is fine too. I have uh, one of my coaches from years back said, you keep trying to they die or they buy. I don't know if I agree with that philosophy, Um, but to be observant and to be patient and to find that balance between driving forward and needing to have it and just saying, no, I can't do it. That again is uh, almost a Buddhist idea of walking that middle path. And I think that's Mm. something that's difficult to attain. And you're coaching people how to get into that mindset I would see how that would generalize out to their whole life. Have any of your clients ever said that to you? No, but it's funny that you would bring that up because part of this go for no challenge that I do also involves getting personal no's. And this could be in any area. Uh, it could be, and, and there's a, a young man who named Zha Zhang who wrote a book called Rejection Proof. It came out, I think, in like 2014. Oh, wow. And he talks about, he, he goes through this hundred days of just asking. Every day he asks for some crazy thing in order to face that rejection, survive it. And so that is something that we do in our challenges as well. Because if you think about it, we get rejected from the people close to us all the time. We just don't take it personally. It doesn't, it's completely safe. Getting those no's are feel completely different. And I think it's because we're just interpreting them in a completely different way. We interpret whoa, them. Whoa. That's a mic drop. <laughs> That's a mic drop that that when we have a certain kind of relationship with people, we can interpret the no in a different way than when we're in a sales kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a really good, you're dropping some, you're doing some mic drops here. Um, going for no sounds negative to some people. I don't think so. You'd have to be pretty reactionary and not listen, really listen to you to get it. But how do you explain that, that it sounds negative to some people? Well, we, I mean, we've created a heck of a marketing challenge, I will just tell you, for the last 20 no years. More. Seriously. No, no you are, I, honestly, I don't mean to like butter you up either, but you are, a, there are certain enlightened people or who have had a certain level of experience. I don't, it, it varies and I never know what somebody is going to be, but there are people who look at that title and say, oh, I get it. That's a genius. And, and I, and I get it or not necessarily even it's genius, but it's, I understand it. It makes sense. And then you have some people who say, I don't want no, I want yes. Why would I go for no? That seems so ridiculous. It seems so stupid. And so, and, and there's a, type of person who wants, and I get it, and it's a fair, it, this is a fair concern. I want only positive things, right? They want their reticular activating system to be, be focused on the positive. And if you are thinking about no, and I always say, you're not wishing, hoping, and praying to get a no. You're not expecting a no, but you have to be accepting of no as part of well, the wait, process. Wait a minute. The law of attraction says you just think yes, 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 and what you want will just come to you. You're violating the sacred, holy writ of the law of attraction. Oh, my dear, you blasphemer, you. <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> 
it. So that, so that's part of it. And that is the negativity that we, that's why the subtitle is so important, uh, which is yes is the destination, no is how you get there. We want people to be clear that yes is obviously what we want, but you can't expect to go through life in this bubble wrapped thing and get nothing but yes and never hear no. And I get very skeptical of people who are out there saying that that's what they can do. I'm much more trusting of people who say no's are out there. Let's figure out how we can work with them or give you tools to deal with those no's, whether it's a mindset thing or something that you can say differently that is a pattern interrupt, like you like to say, right? Um, And pattern interrupt them so that you can take them on a different path. Yeah, you know, I think the culture that people were in would also determine how well they received the message. I'm a baby boomer, I get it. But I would guess that Generation Z would go, what do you mean no? I'm entitled to everything right now. I would think that people have to drop the mentality of being entitled, and they also have to let go of needing to know what the outcome's gonna be. Mm, yes, they have to yes, put yes. Up don't know, which is very difficult for for human beings to put yeah, up. Yeah, and, and you are right about that. One of the things I remember hearing you say recently is um, uncertainty and how that is such a big challenge for people. And I think um, I want to incorporate that more in my teachings as reminding people, I think that uncertainty of not knowing, I'm going to ask something and I don't know if they're going to say yes or no. So I'm putting myself in a very vulnerable position. It probably is exactly what you're talking about with that fear of uncertainty. Yeah, and I think what you're doing, let me throw it back to you. It kind of feels like a mutual admiration society. You're, you're teaching vulnerability and staying into the conversation, which I think is a beautiful conver- a beautiful mm-hmm. compliment one to the other. This is fantastic. I want you back on the show, by the way. Let's agree right now that you're coming back on my show. Yes, and let me come back so I can interview you because I have a bunch of questions for you as well. Well, do you have a podcast? <laughs> I don't, so I have to come back okay. on your show and ask All you right. questions. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, here's another question for you that's not on the list. In fact, watch this. <laughs> I'm radically different. We're throwing it in the air. And We're really fine. going crazy now. I'm going crazy now because you're a great interview. You've been doing this 20 years. How do you stay passionate about it? Because you're obviously passionate about it. I could see people being passionate for five years, 10 years. You're as passionate as it. So how do you stay passionate about doing this after that you've been doing it so long? That is so easy for me to answer. And the answer to that question is that there's always a nuance, like literally Even as I told you, because I knew I was coming on the show, I studied up, I listened to some of your podcasts and there was so much I heard. I said, oh, that's new. I can figure out a way to kind of incorporate this thought into my teaching. So I think it's probably because I get so much personal growth myself out of it. And I'm always figuring out um, how to teach it better, how to explain it better, different nuances as technology has changed. I've had to adapt and say, okay, can you go for no on social let's, media? Let's, let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about that. How does the change of technology apply to going for no? So the one thing that I've noticed, and to your point, because I've had conversations with millennials, not Gen, not Gen Z as much, but they have just as much terror hitting send on an email as we would have had in our generation of picking up the phone and cold calling a stranger. That sounds ridiculous. To it me. does, believe, but it's true. I believe you. I believe you. Yeah, or a te- or or a text. They have just as much anxiety and fear about that rejection of sending that text and not getting a response, or getting a no, or you know that type of thing. Because, and you know that I mean the fear of rejection is really hardwired into our brains. Yeah. So the technology is just making it, I think, faster. Um, it's making it almost more real for them because that's where they live. So I find it fascinating. That's why I'm passionate about it. It's just every day is it's the same and yet it's different. That's pretty cool. I, here's another question that occurs to me is that how do people who are learning your technology or system, how do you teach them to deal with no's that are 
I once read somewhere, I don't remember where, that rejection is not as difficult. The really difficult thing is rejection that's being lied about. You can tell the person's lying to you. So how do you teach people to deal with no's that are obvious? Hey, we really love your presentation. Everything you said is great. Uh, we're going to talk it over and we'll give you a call. And you just sense that you're being lied to. Is there a distinction in your mind between a hard no and when you know that person's bullshitting you and they're saying uh, they're, they're lying and I really don't like being lied to. I'm not only getting a, a, a rejection, I'm having my intelligence insulted. Mm. That is such a good question. And you, again, see, this is so interesting. Now, this is a whole other thing that I could dig into. What I think what I'm hearing you say is this is where persuasion comes into play. And it's where questions like, can you turn a no into a yes come into play? But also in that moment, do you have the courage to just call them on it and say, you know what? Um, Normally, when people are this enthusiastic and, and they're so interested in moving forward, there is no hesitancy. So the fact that you're hesitant is concerning. So what about what we've talked about, right? Oh, wow. and, and so what about ha- that we've talked about, should I know? Or is it just that you, and this is where you have to have the courage to call this out, is it just that you don't want to say no to me right now here in this room? And by all means, I'm happy to have you tell me no and go on my way. And you have to be good with that. That's brilliant. I want to steal that from you so I can use that. So <laughs> all of my fans and viewers who are watching that, uh, I transcribed this, this interview. And that, that was, that was uh, absolutely amazing. You're teaching people to be, in a sense, confrontational, but in a way that's that's vulnerable and sincere. You're taking a paradox, a seeming paradox, confrontational and being vulnerable. People would think that's a paradox, but in, in my mind, in paradox, there's power. So you're teaching people mm. how to resolve that paradox and show up in a way that's very unique. People well, and how I how I recommend people show up is is completely honest. I'm a big fan of calling out the elephant in the room. So if you see something say it because they know what's going on. It's like, everybody knows what's going on. It's like, it's like the, it's like the messed up family dinner on Thanksgiving. Everybody knows what's going on. (laughs) So you might as well just say it, get it out. Um, And then we can have an honest dialogue. I'm usually the one who's causing the mess up at the family dinners. (laughs) (laughs) I believe that. (laughs) Uh, You believe that. Um, This has been so absolutely amazing. I want to know, How can people, what is it, the gift that you have for the audience? And I'm going to ask you how you think you get even better gifts. So, I mean, this gift is amazing. Tell us the gift that that you would like to give our audience. So we developed, this is an unscientific, I am no uh, scientist and neither is my husband, Richard, but we have a no quotient assessment, which is a fun assessment. And it's very, very hard to get a good score on this because the questions are asked in double negatives and they're counterintuitive. So it's it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to get through this quiz. Uh, But there's a 20 question quiz on our website at gofornow.com. And that's the free gift. I would love people to go and take it. And you do get your, your your analysis. So you can kind of see where your mind, it's really mindset of where you are in relationship to failure and rejection. Love it. You've been a wonderful guest. I'm going to get you back on the podcast, whether you interview me or not. Okay. Thank you, uh, Andrea Waltz. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Once again, you have brought me some epiphanies, and I'm going to have this podcast transcribed because I want, in fact, I'm going to ask you a favor off the air. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you the next time on The Influencer's Edge. Thanks, everybody. The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1. 909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. 
Thank you for tuning in to The Influencer's Edge, where you get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, tools, and techniques so you can leapfrog over the pack at sales, influence, and persuasion. Remember to visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com to enjoy even more great episodes like this one. We look forward to seeing you again on The Influencer's Edge Show. Thank you.